be the support system to the leaders that are making the charges to the governors of the this like ecocidal war we're in and you will be so valuable and you will be so needed and you will be so respected and so tenderly cared for as somebody who just shows up and does the dishes and listens You're listening to the Almost 30 Podcast, hosted by Krista Williams and Lindsay Simsek. Almost 30 started as a conversation about the transition from our 20s to our 30s. But then we realized life is full of transitions. So we expanded our mission. We are an intuition-led, wellness-focused lifestyle podcast that promises to deliver authentic conversations, diverse points of view, and insights rooted in optimism, growth, and intention. The Almost 30 Nation community is a group of purposeful dreamers who are smart, passionate, and always seeking the full potential in every aspect of their lives. At Almost 30, we're making magic together. We dream it, and then we do it. Thanks so much for tuning into the Almost 30 Podcast. Here we go. Welcome back to Almost 30. Welcome back, guys. <laughs> I had to think of what I was going to say because I feel like I've been saying lately like, hey guys. This is, and this I is a podcast about blank. This is a podcast about... <laughs> Just kidding. We're so glad you're here. If you are new here, my name is Krista Williams. And I'm Lindsay Simsek. And we are super grateful that you chose us to listen to today. And we are excited to take you along this journey. And we're no longer almost 30. Yep. We get questions all the time. Yep. They're like, what's going on? Why are it. you frauds? Mm-hmm. And we know a lot of you are not almost 30 anymore and all different ages. And we're happy to have you. It's yep. for everybody. It's a state of mind. All the girls in the Facebook group were talking about that. They were like, how old is everyone? And everyone was all over the map. Cool. Male, female, whatever you identify as, whatever age you identify as, you are welcome here. This is all about personal growth, development, being super honest, being vulnerable and learning as much as we can. Yeah. How are you? I'm great. I just had the best, best brunch with... Maria Nila, mm. which I'm super excited about. Because I know that for, for almost 30, I've been looking for a clean uh, hair care brand for a really long time. And I haven't found one that I like or that I felt connected to. And, and now I just feel like our puzzle is almost complete of having yes. the clean um, home care, having clean skincare, having clean um, food, having you know clean adaptogens, supplements, clothes. whatever, clean clothes. Mm-hmm. I'm wearing my jumpsuit. Mm-hmm. And then having the clean hair care brand was like the missing puzzle piece. And their team is amazing. Why is it so hard to have... Oh, I want to hear about the team. Why is it so hard to have clean hair care? Because I agree any, like any that I've tried yeah. recently and I haven't tried this brand. So I'm really excited. It's just like, I think our whole lives we've been putting chemicals in our hair to keep it fresh and bouncy and whatnot. So maybe it's just, I don't know. It's just hard. It's a little bit like when you start to use clean hair care brands, it's a little bit like when you first use clean deodorant where there's almost, there is a process of like a transitionary period. You know, if you, if you're using this, like whatever brand chemical laden type brand, and then you're going to use clean, you know, it might not work as, as well, quote unquote at first. But with hair care, it's kind of the same. And it's so expensive because chemicals are so much cheaper than if you were to get all natural ingredients like jojoba oil or, you know, different types of oils and ingredients that are are included in the hair care. And what's cool about Maria Nila is that they're vegan, cruelty-free. A lot of factories in the places where they make the products, they actually own themselves. So a lot of brands white label. So they will pay someone else to make the formulas, to make the ingredients, and then just package it as if it's their own. So they actually don't have that much control over the process. And Maria Nila uses um, solar panels for a lot of their their factories, which is amazing. Wow. And the family today was just, it's like kind of family owned, which is so great. And they were just so sweet and their packages are, you know, for the most part consumer, they're recycled. And then they're doing a plastic line. So the the line is going to be like beach waves and it's made of plastic from the oceans. 
So kind of like the concept that Adidas did with the sneakers where mm. it can they take plastic that's directly from the ocean through some organization that I forget, but they take the plastic and can use it for their packaging. Wow. So they're doing stuff like that and they're just like super thoughtful. I, I just really enjoyed their team and I really love what they're doing. And they also have these really cool products where you can do like a colored pigment mm. that's natural and it lasts in your hair for like a week. So a lot oh, of the girls on the team had like pink hair, lilac hair, like Pretty. so gorgeous and it looked so good. Cool. I'm so excited. So do you wash it in or is it like yeah, a... Yeah, you can wash it and it cool. lasts like seven washes. Cool. So one of the girls had a really pigmented pink and it was fresh. And then the other girl had a lighter pink, but it had been washed like three or four times. And then they have purple and green and all these cool colors. And it's just like such a fun thing to do for summer. That is so fun. I, I, I was thinking about that. I was Dude, like, you Ooh, should. that'd be fun. Honestly, we can get some from them. Yeah. And uh, like a lot of the girls that were there had used it and it looked amazing. I want like a couple colors. To I, I know. <laughs> they have such good colors too. There's like there's like a rose gold. There's a light pink. There's a lilac. There's a green. They also have like silver and you can do brown. So I was thinking about getting cool. like a, a dark brown to put in my hair. That'd be fun. Right? Because you can just go brown for a while. Oh, that's a genius idea. I know. I love that. I know. And with them too, a lot of the fragrance, the fragrances are natural. So, you know, for a lot of different brands, that's kind of where it can get tricky mm-hmm. as far as being um, toxic ingredients is in the fragrance and all their fragrances are natural too. And I felt really grateful because we are the first brand that they've done anything with in the United States. So wow. when um, their PR team, Beach House, Marie from Beach House is is amazing. She did a great job with working with them. She brings a bunch of different ideas and brands and partnerships to them. And, you know, Emma from their team started listening and she really loves the podcast and just felt, you know, connected to us and compelled. And it was just so fun to get to know them. And I just feel really great about the relationship and I'm excited to like see what we can do. So exciting. Yeah. And it's, it's so also exciting. hard to like, um, and, and the fact that they did it so well just speaks volumes. Like it's LA, there's a lot of events, there's a lot of things like that. So to bring together, you know, in quote unquote influencers, we are, you know, it's a term that can, can be overused, totally. but we, we, t- we do take it very seriously you know, when we get to know brands, but to do that well and to educate people who are there is so important and to do it in a way where they can take the information like you just did. It's just so, it's so important because it's not just about like getting the free product, like taking the Instagram pictures. It's like, no, like why do we care about this brand? Why is it important? And why should more people know about it and incorporate it into their life? So for me, it's like, I was, I'm probably the only person that left with that information because I went to that event to meet the founders mm-hmm. or to meet the, mm-hmm. the CEO and the marketing team and to ask them those questions because our girls are going to ask those questions. Right. So it was really like people there got the product. They know it's amazing. They know it's quality, but they don't know all the information that I asked. I sat next to the CEO so I could ask him all these questions. So I could talk to him about that and I could hear their story because... If I'm going to bring a product to our audience, we need to be doing that. You know, we need to be super thoughtful about it. And we do, you know, we definitely do. But I was even thinking about even more so being thorough with it. But each of the brands that we brought on in the past couple months and, and for the most part are people that we know personally, you mm-hmm. know, that that know us personally. And that's what I want to continue to do as as we grow. And yeah, it was awesome. It's just interesting though, too, because you know, in the influencer community, there's like a bunch of girls that come to these and that are super young and that have only done influencing as a job this and is, this is the new age i actually feel really <laughs> i actually feel really bad for them i'm not i'm not going to fucking lie because Whoa. it's just like they, i want to say like that's not real life but it just the the amount of gratitude that you would have coming into this industry after having a job in the quote unquote corporate world where you can then have flexibility. And when you're then given these opportunities is like so much greater than if you're just an influencer out of college. Completely agree. It would just completely skew your mindset. And I see it happening. There's a group of girls that I always see you know, at events that have beautiful Instagrams. They're amazing and sweet and kind and, and all of these things. But it's just like, you could tell that... It's just not real life. You know what they're doing. It's like you you get all this stuff given to you at such a young age. You don't have to, you work for it in a sense. You know, some bloggers work very hard. Some influencers work very hard. 
I'm in that industry. I know how hard people work. But in a lot of senses, it's like just skewing your mindset of like what's real. Absolutely. I mean, how could you like I I firmly believe and we've both worked in this industry, even, you know, working in your teens and like the service industry in some capacity, whether it is restaurants or bars or, you know, teaching tennis to little kids or whatever the yeah. hell, lifeguarding, like just serving other people, yes. getting your people's skills in check, really basic business skills, you know, f- handling your money, all of that and reporting to authority in a way, right? But yeah, it is actually kind of scary. Like the first ones that came to mind are, uh, oh God, Aunt Becky's kids. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Lori Laughlin. Mm-hmm. And her husband, Mas- Masimo, Massimo. They have... um their kids are in a lot of trouble right now, but... Um, Olivia but, Jade is her name. Yeah. Beautiful. Like Stunning. everything's so beautiful and so curated and, and and done so well. It's just like, I think about that. I'm like, wow, like what does that feel like to just be catapulted into a world where you are being watched and judged, you know, it must be, I can imagine like in private, pretty painful sometimes. And, and being that young, not knowing how to really process it. And I don't know. I'm just like, it it does scare me a little bit. So I don't know. I'm not a parent. So I really don't know what I would do. And who knows like what our kids are going to be interested in. But damn, it's it's because there's no real rules. And as a parent, you can't be like on their account. You can't be looking at like what stories they're posting or like what little snaps they're sending. So, and and what they're getting back. So, like the comments that they're getting, you know what I mean? Which is actually probably a little bit scarier because you could have just trolls on the internet possibly getting into their little sweet brains. Yeah. And it was, it just also too, like for something like that, a lot of the industry is based on looks. So, if you are a beautiful girl, it is more likely that you will be in this industry. And there's just not an ability for you to develop a personality. Mm, for you to yeah. for you to really like hone in on who you are as a person outside of this online life. And it's just something I'm super grateful. You know, I was never that pretty where it would be like, oh, this is the only thing that she's gonna do. But like I'm just so grateful that I got in at the time I did and that I'm here now because it's like I go to these events, I talk to the founders of things. We're talking business the entire time. Like mm-hmm. I'm saying what's up to people and and all of that. And I'm very picky about the things I go to now. But these girls, it's really like come in, hang out with the only friends you have there, be on your phone the whole time, take the pictures and and that's pretty much it. Yeah. And but there is an anxiety component, you know, that they have around what they do because it is so public. Sure. And they might not be able to express themselves because it's a scary thing to do, you know, when it is public and people are judging you and all of these things. So it's a generalization that I'm definitely making, but it's a generalization from the experience that I've had kind of going to these things and understanding that like I'm a contributor to this and that I'm in this industry. And I think it really serves you know, your example of of talking business and having an intention when you go into these events. So I know 100. all of you out there are not <laughs> doing this on a regular basis. However, this also applies to work events. This applies to maybe even, you know, uh, there's a new restaurant any opening and you're going even any networking or anything. Literally. So if 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 you're feeling a little eh on on the fence about going, maybe it's about finding an intention. So it could be about business. It could be about making one connection. It could be about asking three top questions that you've been, you know, that have been on your mind. Or maybe it's just like, I want to connect with one new person that's really like cool, authentic, and we could just like shoot the shit for 10 minutes. You know, not putting too much pressure on the situation, but also having an intention or a focus so that when you're there, it's productive. And when you leave, you feel like, cool, can do that. Can do that again. You know, hundred percent. We just learned that, you know, and, and now we kind of split up just because we have things going on all the time. So it, sometimes it's really good when we're together, but sometimes it's cool when we like kind of split up and do the things and have these conversations. And then it feels like multitasking. Yeah, totally. You know, like when I can go to something and you can, it's like, we're still getting stuff exactly. done or whatever. And yeah, that's what I do now with all of these. It's like meeting Sarah Merrill at that one thing, mm, you know, mm-hmm. just Sarah totally. Merrill of Big Kid Problems on Instagram. And we also did podcast interviews on her podcast, Big Kid Problems. 
little shout out, but just going and and having a purpose and wanting to meet one person, you know, wanting to connect with one person. I don't want to meet everyone. You know, there's kind of no point for me to do that. It's like, hello, 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 hello. Instead, like getting deep with with someone. Right. But yeah, it was just, it was really good. And it was fucking beautiful today. Like so beautiful. Where was it again? The Line Hotel. Oh, I love the Line. So they had all these flowers and stuff. And oh my gosh, this, what is it? A more fair? Yeah. A more fair, you guys? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know how it's to okay. say it. it. It's French, but it means green, green love. love. And they're at shopgreenlove.com. Slash almost, almost 30. 30. Code this jumpsuit almost 30. is life. It's so, the, it's the, the material is thing so ever. buttery. It's crazy. So buttery. I just got and my it's dress. It's so flattering. I love it on I you. I feel so comfortable. I'm like, it's catch the, her wearing it for the next five days, y'all. <laughs> I mean, at least, at least. Yeah, but that's like our MO. Like, give me something that's easy, that's comfortable. Versatile. Versatile, doesn't pull at the wrong places. Complimentary, it's soft. Yeah, and it's sustainable. Just toss in, and toss in the, in the wash. You yeah. don't have to like dry clean all the time. Yeah. I mean, I don't dry clean anything. Yeah. If it's dry clean only, it's destroyed. For me. <laughs> like, what is that? It's so funny. Forever 21, like so fucking cheap. And it's like dry clean only. I'm like oh, paying no. more for dry cleaning of than course. you do for the actual clothes. I dry. I now go to a green dry cleaner and it's very expensive. What I does just, that even mean? So they don't use like chemical stuff. I don't even know. I, I still think they're probably using chemicals to be I, honest. I know. I... But I dry clean some stuff because I... My washer and dryer doesn't take shit That's up. being an adult though. It's like I actually guess. doing the dry cleaning of certain stuff. I guess. To be honest. I remember like actually... Like, I pick up my dry cleaning. I'm like, what? When I was younger, I this is a very a big aside, but like, you know how you remember events in your childhood that are like, weren't probably a big deal, but it was so dramatic. Yes. My Nana, her dry cleaner lost a blouse of hers and she ended up taking him to court. And I literally thought the world was ending because it was just this, in my mind, like of this big thing. Court. I was court? like, Nana's going to court. I mean, my Nana does not fuck around. She does not fuck around when it comes to her clothes and her shoes. She has like this, a size four and a half foot, narrow, double, triple narrow, only wears like very expensive Italian shoes. Wow. So anything with like shoes or clothing, she's like, we're going to court. Doesn't matter. But anyway, dry cleaners. I love that she wanted that like for justice purposes too. Oh yeah. You know, you're And like, I remember like driving past the dry cleaner and being like, oh, ew. Oh my You know what God. I mean? Yeah, Where you like, like hold grudges totally. and you're like, why am I holding a grudge? But Nana says so. Totally. Anyway. Well, I'm so glad that was great. And I'm really excited too. to partner with them. Wow. Me too. I can yeah, be been... more excited to like introduce you girls to them. It's so it's, it's we should really all good. do a co- like a hair color. I would love that. And do like <laughs> I'm going to. I said to, I told Justin like last year, I was like, I think I'm gonna dye my hair lilac. He's like, oh, 30. He's like, this is 30. I'm like, yeah, bitch, this is 30. He's like, Chrissy, you can't do that when you're 30. I'm like, whatever. Watch dude. me. Whatever, be like, dude. Be like, don't turn on your back, dude. You might get a pink head. No. That'd be cool, actually. I, it'd be amazing. That would I just saw it in my head. But I just my hair is darker now, so it doesn't hold. You have to be super white. To hold oh, the pigment. like the light, yeah, like light, it, it light blonde, porous. Yeah, porous. It has to be porous. Super porous. That's why mm. it's like the white attracts the color. So when you're a lighter blonde, it's better. So when you're at this color, it's just kind of like, eh. But the you could do, do like an ombre. That'd be yeah. fun. That would be cool. Yeah. That'd cool be real guys. cool. Anyway. <laughs> cool guys. <laughs> How did we just make that cool to talk about? I don't know. <laughs> no, but I'm sure a lot of people will be interested. Okay. On the podcast today... We are so, so excited. We have Ayana Young on the podcast. Oh, I'm excited so about this one. So speaking of saving saving the planet with everything you do, use and practice, she is just an incredible advocate for Mother Earth. She co-created the Environmental Working Group to help orient the movements to the realities of a suffering planet. So we actually haven't talked a lot directly about protecting Mother Earth, about what is going on with Mother Earth, about the environment, about what we can do to help. So this conversation is really important for us to have. And during it with Ayana, we were able to make sure it's actionable, educational, and that we learned about her and her process along the way. And she was coming to us live from her little cabin. She lives really off the grid. It looked 
so sweet so and <laughs> just so dreamy. But it's on an organic farm. So she grows all of her own food. It's in Oregon on a mountaintop. It just looked so incredible. And she also... So a part of For the Wild, there are different organizations like the Million Redwoods Reforestation Product uh, Project, For the Wild Podcast, which is so, so good. And then there's a new spinoff series birthed from a preservation campaign around the Tongas National Forest, which she's a part of as well. I love that. So during this conversation, we talk about um, empowered earth stewardship and everything that we can do um, to protect our lovely mother earth. So we're excited to bring this conversation to you. We are grateful to Ayana for joining us to speak to this and let's do whatever we can. Truly. Thank you all for listening. Please, please share this podcast. More people need to know how they can help. We always get questions like, how can we do more? So this is definitely a a podcast and a resource for that. And you can visit us on tour. We can't wait to see you. Almost30podcast.com slash tour. We hope to meet you all one day. And follow us on Instagram for all the announcements at Almost30podcast. We'll read a review on the other side. Enjoy this one. Enjoy. Tried and true. Hum Nutrition is almost 30 nations favorite. We've heard from so many of you that incorporating Hum Nutrition into your routine has made you feel better on the inside and radiant on the outside. I'm on a skin kick, so I'm using topicals and supplements to help improve my skin. And Hum Nutrition has a supplement called Skin Heroes. It's a pre and probiotic. Uh, So it really nurtures the gut and the skin. As you know, your gut health is so closely connected to your skin health. So we got to get it right. This is for acne prone skin, non-cystic and I'm seeing incredible results. So I'm no longer getting these really inflamed breakouts. Everything has settled down completely and I'm just really happy with it. I also pair it with the red carpet, which is really great for your hair and skin. So it hydrates your hair and your skin cells. You'll find black currant seed oil, gamma linolenic acid, and vitamin E. Vitamin E is crucial for healthy skin. So I pair those together. I've seen great results and I'd love to know how you guys are feeling. So go to humnutrition.com. You take a quick quiz. It takes about three, five minutes and a certified nutritionist will recommend five different supplements just to get you started. And then you can just shop around. They have so many amazing products. I love the Hum Collagen Pop. I pop that in my water when I need my kick of collagen for my hair, skin, and nails. I mean, you can never get enough, truly. So humnutrition.com, use the code ALMOST30. You'll get 15% off your first order. So that's humnutrition.com. Code is ALMOST30 for 15% off your first order. It's been so rainy in LA. You should see the mountains. I was hiking the other day with a friend and the mountains are so lush and green. It is beautiful. It's stunning. It's like, it it happened so quickly, honestly, in a week. They, they, everything just kind of came up again and it's, and even in Malibu Mm -hmm. where the fires were, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of green already kind of just filling the hills and stuff. A lot of times fires will kind of create fertilizer for the soil and so it's oh. really vibrant. Oh, how so? What how how does that happen? Well, in depending on what ecosystem you're in, like there's actual mm. cer- there's certain seeds that need fire. The the fire actually uh scarifies them, they open up the cones, whatever. So it's it it's really regenerative mm. and California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, I mean these landscapes have evolved with fire for time and memorial. I mean, indigenous people used to actually set fire to the landscapes. So it's wow. really fascinating when you are dive into the history of fire. We actually have less fires now than we historically have. We have less biomass now than we have historically have ever had in terms of whatever we can collect scientific data from. So um, there's a lot of myths and misinformation around fire. And I think it's really interesting because as climate change continues to ramp up, We're going to see so much anti-fire initiatives through things like 
salvage logging. Like they're going to, it's basically going to be like, let's Mm. the industry, the logging industry and the government who's making subsidies off of it. They're going to be like, we should log, we should log to protect everybody from fire. But really that actually just speeds up climate change, releases more carbon. And it it actually is just going to create more of these catastrophic fires in the long run. And it's really fascinating because people are so, you know, especially in the West, there's so much emotions around fire. Right. People are afraid, you know, they don't want to lose their homes, their family, their loved ones. And I totally understand that. And this land will always have fire. So we have to, Mm -hmm. we have to create different relationships with this. And it's not a, it's, it's not so much a natural disaster. It's a natural process. And as humans, Mm -hmm. we have ignition things all over, you know, it's like everything, you know, we got lighters, we got cars, we got generators we uh, we got refrigerator everything yeah. we do is kind of like a combustible you know all this modern technology is all combustible so it's i mean i could talk about that for hours on end but it's really fascinating yeah could you just kind of i guess i i i guess the part about the how it helps with climate change could you walk me through that one more time well no because I, I have a hard time help with climate it's, change what i meant is that yeah like in the farm bill for instance Yep. They are trying to implement these procedures that are really just logging. I, that's what it is. But in the bills, we're calling it these... And logging is basically cutting down trees. For... Exactly. For money. Mm-hmm. For profit. Commercial yes. use. Yeah. So, so really, instead of just saying this is logging, we're in the 1970s, that's what we'd say. But because of like the green movement politicians and big industry, they know how to market it. And so they market it as climate resiliency. It's like, well, how how the hell is cutting down a forest that's sequestering carbon and creating soil and habitat and also keeping the hydrology of water in the soil? How is that climate resiliency to cut all that down and then let the sun beat down, kill all the micronutrients, the fungi in the soil and stop water hydration of soil? But, but mm-hmm. like, we have to be really aware. And I'm not saying that it's, I'm not giving, I don't like to give black and white statements of like, it's, it's either this or that. But I think it's really important for us to be really questioning what we're going to be seeing coming through politically around fire, especially in California in the next, definitely the next decade, we're going to see a lot happening. Wow. For our listeners, I'd love for them for you to paint the picture of kind of like where you are right yeah, now. Yeah. Cuz I know yeah, like so we can see you, but they can only hear okay. you. So, um, I'd love for you to paint the picture of of where you are on planet mm-hmm. and then in your mm-hmm. little cabin. Yeah, so I am in Northern California and I'm around 4 or 5 hours depending how slow you drive. I drive very slow <laughs> uh, above the Bay mm-hmm. Area and I'm in this incredible coastal mountain range that is gifted with redwood and madrone and tan oak, Douglas fir, Pacific yew, chinkapin, manzanita, um, mountain jasmine, just an incredible cast of characters of plants who live here. And of course, um, cougars or mountain lions also live here. They have visited me before which was really incredible because they're usually very shy, although ferocious creatures. We have black Mm. bear and um, raven and salmon, not as many as I and many of us would want because they have been totally decimated by industrial civilization. Yeah, it's, it's really incredible. This land has been through so much destruction and rape over the past few hundred years, but there's still so much vitality and brilliance in this landscape and I believe in all landscapes. So I'm in this little place that has been, has been hurt, but this land is so beautiful. And yeah, so here I am and it's a bit of kind of a wintry spring day. It's not raining, which I love the rain. So I'm a little sad, but it'll be okay. The rain's going to come back a little Mm -hmm. bit more before summer hits. And I'm in a little spruce cabin that I built a few years ago when I was really desperate because I was living in a tent for two years with no running water or electricity. And I was so cold and I was so wet and everything I owned was just molding. And I looked 
to my land partner at the time and I was like, we got to do something. We got to do something. And it was February, which is a rainy month, but we randomly had two weeks of sun. And so we just went for it, you know, clearing, hand clearing it, hand leveling it, which was a lot of work. I remember driving my car over the soil to compact it before we put the foundation down. And then it was around 3 a.m. and we're uh, with our headlamps, like hammering the last nail on the roof. And then the rain starts again. And it was this victorious moment of like, we did it. Like we're not, you know, we're going to be in a dry space. In no way was the interior done, but at least the shell of this little cabin was going to be a dry and somewhat warm place. Well, it's beautiful. Wow. And how did you, so I guess like taking us back, how did you come to the place where, you know, you are where you are building your own cabin, really advocating for the earth Mm -hmm. and being such a friend to the earth? What was your journey Mm -hmm. like to bring you to this place of love and respect for mother nature? Yeah, gosh. Well, I think that there was always something inside of me that knew I just didn't know the language. I didn't, I didn't have a community of activists or earth defenders. I mean, I grew up in Southern California. I was very much a SoCal gal. I didn't, I don't even know if I knew what the Redwoods were growing up. I mean, maybe I did kind of peripherally. Um, and I just, I had this feeling that something wasn't right. And I didn't know to call it consumerism. I didn't know to call it capitalism. I didn't know imperialism, colonialism. I didn't know these terms, but there was something in my body that was like, what's going on here? What's going on here? There, it was an intuition feeling. And I'd say, you know, there's bits and pieces of my rebellious revolutionary self that came out in high school, you know, stealing Bush Cheney signs from people's lawns in Orange County and burning them at Balsa Chica Beach and then having the cops come up. And you're like, oh no, hide the signs, hide the signs, like sand over the burn, burn pile. Um, you know, and I was like watching Michael Moore documentaries and I remember Super Size Me was really shocking. I like never ate fast food after that. So there's all these little, you know, it was kind of like I was collecting my basket of little moments that I was like, okay, this is not right, but ooh, this is okay. So people are talking about this and people are talking about that. And my interest grew and my knowledge grew. But then I was in New York and I was studying ecology because I knew like I wanted to do something in the environment. But even looking back at myself now in college, I was like, oh my gosh, I knew nothing. Like I don't even know how I even thought of taking ecology. And then Occupy Wall Street broke out and I dropped out of school and I became a full-time political organizer literally overnight. Like I went from never doing it to then starting the Environmentalist Solidarity Working Group and leading 100 people meetings in the Deutsche Bank lobby in downtown Manhattan and like protesting. And, and I was so enlivened by it. And part of the reason why it was so exciting to me was because I was around other people who were pissed and passionate as much as I was. And, I, and it wasn't like going to a dinner party and then everybody being like, oh God, not this girl again. But instead it was like people being like, yeah, yeah, like, yes, we feel the same way or, or yes, we agree, but like maybe this is our angle on it because in, especially in Occupy, the reason I created the Environmentalist Solidarity Working Group is because the movement wasn't really oriented around the environment. The movement was more oriented around jobs and the economy, which of course is really important, but there is no jobs or economy on a dead planet. So we do have to be holding all these complex pieces at once. And it's so complicated. The, the place that we've, we find ourselves in at this, this juncture, these really troubled times, it's so complicated. And we're so intertwined on every le- level to this very resource extractive system that creates so much pain for humans, creatures, the planet, the waters, the sky. And so the more that I... So at Occupy, I think was really the moment that I decided to commit all the way because before I was kind of like here, I was like kind of in, I was kind of not, I was floating and I felt chronically dissatisfied in this feeling of floating and not being grounded to a mission, not being committed, not taking vows and saying, I commit to something that is in service of something Mm -hmm. in which I'm totally in love with. And um, Occupy was a catalyst for me to to go all in. And then um, from there, I mean, I've... Can you... Ed- uh-huh. Yeah. Can you educate me then? I guess, how did you incorporate what you wanted to do with the environment in the Occupy Wall Street movement? Because mm-hmm. I'm having a hard time seeing the correlation between it, but I know it's mm-hmm. 
me being naive to what exactly you're doing within that. So can you educate me and then our listeners of how you guys intertwine the environment in the Occupy Wall Street movement? Yeah, sure. This is a this is such a good question and there's so many ways in which I could take it. So I'm like, okay, I, I'm getting all excited. I need to focus myself. Like, what, 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 like, hold on for this question. Woosa, woosa. <laughs> I'm like, mm. For instance, like we're mad at the bankers and the bankers have spent all this money and they bankrupted people and people have lost their, you know, um, security and, or were, or jobs or like there's less unions. And so people are being taken advantage of. Like that was a lot of, you know, I know a lot of people I was talking to just feeling like the richer was getting richer and the poor was getting poorer. And so the poor was having less and less resources, less and less access to any type of security out, you know, work hours, overtime. I mean, you could just kind of go on and on and on the list of like how workers in this country and elsewhere are being treated really poorly and also kept in this place of poverty, basically, or just above the poverty line and, and never really being able to get out because of debt, you know, debt and servitude and like all of these issues that come with the economic system that we're in. But we have to understand like, well, what's beneath the economy? Like what actually creates an economy? How do any of us make money? How? I mean, the que- like, and the answer is, is the earth. There's nothing without resources. That's what we buy and sell. We buy and sell and we trade resources globally. Well, where do those resources come from? Let's just talk about a few of those resources. Water. There's a huge issue of privatization of water all over the world where multinational companies will come into countries like the United States. Take Nestle, for instance. Nestle will come into yep. a town. Mm. They'll buy the rights to the water and then they own the water. You could think about like anything for There's a good documentary on the Nestle thing. What's the do you know know that documentary on the Nestle water thing? I'll look it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. But there's a really, really good documentary on the privatization of water that people should watch. Yeah. And then you think about like anything, our computers, um, like I mean anything around us. It's like where does it come from? It's connected to the fossil fuel industry and it's and which is connecting to the extraction of resources from the planet. And that is how we make money. And that is also how we have jobs. And that's also how multinational corporations have skyrocketed is because of deregulations of people and planet. Now, if you can deregulate and you go, eh, like we don't need to have these groups of, like we don't need to have labor, la- we don't need to have labor groups. because Un- Unions. Yeah, we, union, mm. we, don't, we can re- we can deregulate un, un, unions, we can deregulate environmental yep. impacts on projects. And so who really gets hurt from all of this? I mean, we all get hurt. That's the bottom line. Like Some people think that they can run and hide and they can go into their gated communities for as long as they think that they'll be able to survive. And they probably will be able to have more access to resources for longer periods of time, but we can't escape right. the pollution in the air. And we can't escape yeah. mm-hmm. many of the things things that are are causing so much pain, suffering, cancers, I mean, all of this stuff. Like, so, you know, it's um it's a really big question to answer in terms of how is this all interconnected. But once you start pulling a thread, you realize that it's all coming back to somebody taking something from the planet at no cost. And like let's think about that. You know, most of the time a worker will get paid. Does the earth get paid? For having the resources stolen, no, and and then maybe there's like reclamation. You know, let's say a mining site, and mining is an issue that is so overlooked. And I really want people from this episode to look into mining, especially gold mining, because I know gold mining is this like oh, like you know the can can girls, and it's kind of this romantic notion of this time where people were like shoveling gold in the rivers. Well, it actually created a huge genocide in the West of this country. And now gold mining mm-hmm. still happens, but it happens on such a large level with you know, tractors that are two stories high. And it's a wastewater business, really. It's like 90% of anything that comes out of a mine is wastewater that lasts forever. And what are you going to do with that? And most companies just bankrupt, so they don't have to deal with the wastewater. But anyways, like, so when we look at anything, we're... So they bankrupt to avoid the penalty of wastewater. Uh, well, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to have like... They don't want to have to spend all of their money and resources dealing with the mess that they've created. But then who deals right, with it? Right. So they bankrupt to avoid it. Right. And then who's left with it? Yeah. It's the communities. Yeah. 
and the government doesn't yeah. help that a lot. So I, I might be going in tangents, but it's such a big topic to see how we are related to everything else and how everything that we yeah. use, everything for the most part we make money on, just our modern lives are so directly connected with capitalism, um, yep. taking resources from the planet and not reciprocating. And oh, the reason I brought mining is because after these mining projects, a lot of times they'll say that they're going to reclaim. And maybe we could say, oh, well, that's kind of reciprocity. You're kind of like ruining a place and then maybe putting some plants back. But it's really interesting. One of my dear friends, her name is Jacinda Mack. And she's a native New Hulk woman from Williams Lake and Bella Coola in British Columbia, which is the largest gold mining uh, area in the world. And I know we all Mm. think, oh, Canada is so green and clean and British Columbia is so beautiful. Canada is is horrible in terms of environmental policy. One of the worst countries in the world, actually. So she was telling me like, yeah, you know, they came in and they're, they poisoned our, our tribal land and they poisoned our rivers and our salmon. And then when they come in to do these reclamation, they go, oh, well, what native plants do you want for your you know, native harvesting? Um, and we can put them on top of the mine site. It's like, okay, so you're going you're gonna to reclaim and you're going to give reciprocity back by literally putting plants on poisoned land so that we can then harvest the berries of poisoned land. You, we know the poison gets into the tissues wow. of plants. And then we know that the animals who eat the poisoned plants and the salmon and everything around gets the poison in their tissues. And then there's high cancer rates. So mm-hmm. again, it's like, you know, you just, you start to unravel the thread of, yeah. of Wall Street capitalism, the environment, immigration, migration, you know, like all yeah. of these things, they're, they're so, they're so deeply connected. And, and that's why these issues are huge and there are no quick fixes. Yep. And there are no easy solutions. And I really am somebody who is very skeptical of anybody who talks about solutions because I think we really need to be asking what are, what are they saying that they're going to be solving because um, it's yeah. big. I have been obsessed with astrology lately. I tend to pull up the chart of anyone I meet, especially people I'm dating, which, hey, I know might scare people away, but it really helps me to navigate relationships, learn more about myself and others. It's wildly fascinating. And if you are interested in astrology, I have the app for you. It's taught me so much so I can actually have productive and intelligent conversations with people about their various signs and anything and everything astrology. I am loving the Sanctuary Astrology app. Uh, Basically, it's an astrologer in your pocket. There are horoscopes delivered daily, live chat readings on demand every month for about 50 15 minutes so you get to ask questions to an astrologer live and they all have also have guides to learn astrology which is really interesting so not just your sun sign but we go deeper we go to astrology basics all the way to planetary guides and zodiac guides they have it all so it's really really easy to use and it's just so exciting bringing astrology to people through a modern mode of communication like on an easy to use app. So we are so excited to share this app with you. Just go to sanctuaryworld.co and click on get your horoscope now or go to the app store and type in sanctuary astrology. Let us know what you learn, what you like. Share in the secret Facebook group now, sanctuaryworld.co. Click on get your horoscope now or go to the app store and type in sanctuary astrology. I have a bone to pick with you. Did you finish my Chipotle ranch dressing from Chosen Foods? Did I? Yeah. No, I didn't. (laughs) Guys, we have an issue. We're going through... Wait, I did So much. No, you didn't. (laughs) I was just... Because I'm serious because I would. So I really need to know if I did or didn't. I actually just finished my bottle and I was wondering if I did take it. And you're like, I'm wondering if I can borrow some. (laughs) Literally. Borrow. Eat. There are multiple times a day when... I'm using chosen foods. In the morning, if I'm cooking any veggies, if someone likes eggs, if you have a tofu scramble, I'm using the avocado oil spray or sometimes I'll use like the chipotle avocado spray. Anything on my pan, I'm using chosen foods. And then if I'm cooking for dinner, which happens once a year, I will use my (laughs) avocado oil 
in general, I but know. people like Justin uses it for cooking all the time. I had the mayo on a barely bread bagel and a veggie burger and it was the most amazing thing I've ever eaten. Getting those healthy fats, sister. It feels so good and and their products are so clean. They're the ones that started the avocado oil craze. Yep. You can depend on chosen foods. And actually, interestingly enough, I was talking to my mom. She's been cooking... Uh, people cook with olive oil, whatever. It's fine. But like she was cooking at high temperatures with the olive oil and she didn't know that it like releases toxic shit after like 350 degrees. And she was wondering why there was like a lot of smoke. And I was yeah. like, mom. So I got her on the Chosen Foods train. Avocado oil, oil is the way to go. So um, we love them. We know you'd love them. Uh, they have their new goddess dressings out now. I believe they're sold out coming back soon. They're whipping up another batch and their avocado oil sprays are like there's a cult following. So I would get on that. We love the Simply Cinnamon for our pancakes and also the Chipotle or the garlic are my favorites. Um, so if you'd like to try Chosen Foods, highly recommend you can go to chosenfoods.com slash almost 30 and use the promo code almost 30 for an incredible discount of 50% off your order of $10 or more. That's insane. Chosenfoods.com slash almost 30 and then use the code almost 30 at checkout for 50% off your order of $10 or more. I oftentimes think like solutions are almost just ways to make people like quiet down. Mm -hmm. Like we have a solution. Don't worry. It's being put into place. And I'm also wondering like how, so you said like, it's, it's like a thread and everything is connected. And once you start to pull it, it's kind of, it's, it's crazy to see all mm -hmm. of like the web of the world, just all interconnected. So like when we talk about how information is getting to the masses, like I'm wondering like why it's not like, is there like in why your experience as you've learning? been an advocate? Exactly. Yeah. But I'm just wondering like, you know, it, is there like experiences that you've had as an advocate where you're like, wait, what? Like I can't ex express this or send, you know, information to the masses in this way. Like, because if, you know, just like we now know where our food comes from. We're like, okay, so it's organic and it was mm -hmm. like, you know, there's no, you know, pesticides and whatever, whatever. It's like if we had, a, you know, pieces of paper that were like, or or just products where we knew where it came from and how mm -hmm. it was made and if it was made in a way, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, it, it's just not on a grand scale yet. And I, I kind of understand why, like in a general sense, but like what has been your experience mm -hmm. in trying to, you know, share information because you have so much of it, but I just don't know what the resistance is from like the man and like these corporations. Yeah. But another really good, good question. A lot of, a lot of pieces to it. Well, one, I want to say something about organic right off the bat that organic used to be something that feels organic. What organic is now, we have to be really cautious because organic farms mm -hmm. are allowed to use toxics shit excuse, excuse me i don't think i know if i can say that like there there there's yes. a large handbook of what you can do on organic farms to be qualified as organic and so um it's not created by the uh created by the organic certifier EPA. so whether it's like what is ccof okay. or the uh, usda organic there's all these qualifiers of organic and based off there's there's handbooks there's rules on what farmers can and can't use at what times a year on their crops. Now, for me, I would imagine, oh, organic, that means absolutely no pesticides. That means absolutely no synthetic fertilizers. That means, right? Wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's changed though. It didn't, in, you know, before when the organic movement started, there was much more strict rules around what a farmer could and couldn't use. That has changed because of lobbyists, money, politics, many, many reasons. So just to, just to note <laughs> that, it's really disturbing that even we think when things are labeled organic, it may not be what you think of. It should be organic or is organic. Same things with like natural, yes, like natural totally, doesn't mean shit. Totally. Mm -hmm. Organic is meaning less and less. Yes. Um, so it's like we have to, and pretty yeah. much ev yeah, you have to really educate yourself and really know it's, and that's, what's the most mm -hmm. frustrating thing, you know, on the food piece about, the way our food industry is, is that you, as much as you educate yourself, they're, they're sometimes one or one or two steps ahead mm -hmm. and taking advantage of us one or two steps ahead down the line. Absolutely. Um, so it's really disheartening. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm plant-based mm -hmm. um, to kind of avoid, you know, not saying that to anyone on the podcast, but that's mm -hmm. helps me to 
know the meat, know the source, know the farming practices, all that much better in like a clean, concise way. But yeah. please continue. Yeah. And I think, you know, knowing who, if, if at all possible, knowing who is growing the food, knowing, like connecting to the local sources, because that's what, where we're going to find the highest quality products is with people that we can trust people that aren't just trying to like make a plastic stamp of USDA on, organic on their product but but really and then also then we get to be supporting the people in our communities which helps with everything i mean that's <laughs> supporting our communities is really so much of the of this battle but so in terms of getting this information out to the masses i personally have have not had a challenging time with it for the most part because i don't take money from sponsorships that won't allow me to say things. Um, I remember when I first started the For the Wild podcast, I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll go with the this distribution company. But then I realized that that distribution company was funded by the fracking industry. And because I am outspoken about the fracking industry, um, hydraulic fracturing, I wasn't going to... Uh, stop. I wasn't going to partner with them because there's no way that I'm not going to speak out against that. So um, because I'm independent media and I source the you know income for the podcast through listeners and through foundations that really believe in the mission, I can I don't have to be imprisoned by larger corporate stakeholders that are saying no, 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 because that's how they're getting their money or that's how they're politically intertwined. But I will also say that when I was at Standing Rock and other larger you know, places like that, I have noticed that cell phones will get weird and messages won't go out. And Facebook and Instagram are looking for certain things to not be able to share them as widely as others. I mean, of course, like there is intelligence, counterintelligence. Mm. Like there, there are things at bay that are stopping certain messages from getting through to people. And and we have to know that. Like we do live in a police state and it's only going to get more stringent as climate change continues to rise and crop production and all that jazz, which is a whole other thing in itself. And so, yeah, I don't feel personally worried about my media, but I do think that the other thing that I think is hard for people is, you know, we live in a very fast paced world and we get tired and we don't always want to hear the bad shit all the time. And so I think it's also a choice from people. It's not just like these overlords that are saying, oh, we're not going to give the information to the people, which of course that's anywhere that's going to happen. No, no doubt. Like the powers that be do not want everybody to know things because they want to keep themselves in power and they want to keep making money and they want control. So of course, like there's always going to be that. But then the people on the ground, we have to make a choice that we actually do want to hear it. And not only do we want to hear it, but we actually want to do something about it. And that can be really challenging because it's so overwhelming. And of course, it's heartbreaking. And the grief is enormous. I mean, when you start unraveling some of these things and you start to see that, you know, we probably won't have tigers, elephants, orcas, clean water, you know, any of these uh, val- these things that we value so deeply and realizing that they probably won't be around in another 10 years. I mean, tigers alone have gone from like, in the, oh, there's, I mean, the, actually the statistics on elephants is even more frightening. It was something like millions and millions of elephants. And then the past 200 years is down to like 50,000. And tigers, there's only 4,000 tigers left. Um, there's only 76 orcas left in the Salish Sea. If we lose five more orcas, they're all dead. Like the entire pod will collapse wow. because they can't survive in such a small number of, of of individuals. So salmon have completely collapsed. That's the lifeblood of bear, yeah. orca, seal. I mean, you, the list goes on and on. And And I do sit with this in- information every day because this is how I'm showing up in my commitment to the earth and my commitment to the earth and the vows that I make every day. I, I revow myself to this work and it, and it's, it's, um, it is hard, but it's not as hard as losing everything. Like I'd rather hear what's going on than wake up one day and be like, Oh my gosh, I didn't do anything. Why, why, 
why was it so hard for me just to listen? Why is it so hard for us to witness the reality of our time? And I think if we do it as a community, it's a lot easier because then we have people around us to hold us in our grief. We have people that we can work together so we don't feel like somehow each of us individuals have to take it all on. Like there's no way for each of us individuals to take it all on. That, that's not possible. But if I'm doing something and you're doing something and you're doing something and you look around and everybody in your community is kicking ass and taking on something, then it's enlivening. And it's like, yes, like this is what we need to be doing. This is, this is, this is our reason for being alive is to be in reciprocity with the earth, not to just be taking, taking, taking all the time. And, and so these messages are also really complicated. And I think that's a challenge because the media has one left a lot out of the narrative. But the other piece is that things are oversimplified because when things are simple, people are going to buy them more. And whether that's buying an idea doesn't have to be a thing. So it's like if something is simple, then people go, oh my gosh, yes, it's going to be easy. I can just like throw money at it or I can just like click, you know, click and forward this Facebook thing. And then I can be, oh, I can be relieved and I can like get back to my day. But when people start to understand, oh no, 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 this is lifelong. This is not going to be solved easily. And that scares a lot of people away. And I'm, I think about that a lot, like for me, how to communicate these like literally life-threatening from everywhere you go. I mean, just drastic information and how to communicate that to people that is inspiring rather than paralyzing. But also at the same time being like, hey, people, like we just have to look. And And I think for me, the biggest reason that I know I need to acknowledge what's happening is because the earth knows. Like... Don't doubt for a minute that the earth knows whether you are acknowledging or not. The earth knows whether you're turning away. Just think of a homeless person on the street when you just go, oh, don't look, don't look, don't look, walk, walk, walk. It's the same things like, oh, don't look, don't look. Like, don't look at the logging. Don't look at the orcas dying. Don't look at the water polluted. Don't look at the farms on the I-5 freeway. Don't, just don't look, don't look. Just keep walking. And every time we do that, the pain that we inflict on the creatures or the humans that we're passing by is monumental and I am in deep relationship with the earth and I've always said to the earth like I don't know if anything I will do in my life will you know do anything qu- quant- uh, measurable like I, I don't know at the end of my life if I can be like well this project did this and this project did that but what I do know is that the I am in right relationship with the earth and what I do know is that the earth sees me seeing them And that in and of itself is a huge shift of reciprocity and acknowledgement and love. And what I really think of as unconditional love, because we are going through a total extinction crisis right now and a collapse of many of our systems. But even through that, even through the hardships, even through the pain, even through a lot of the ugliness of what's happening on the earth, I'm still willing to look directly at it and sit and hold the hand of whatever whatever comes and being like, I'm going to be here for you no matter what. And that's what I really want to call people into. Um, of course, the details of these tragedies are important, but the emotional and relational connection, if we don't have that, we're not going to be able to do the work anyways. So it's kind of a, a both and. Like We need to be able to communicate to people how to build these relationships with justice. And at the same time, um, be able to explain details and to a lot of things that people just don't want to hear because it's overwhelming, painful. And we live in a really grief illiterate culture. You know, we don't, we're not raised in a way that we are even sit with dead bodies once they've passed. I mean, we're, it's kind of like, ooh, sad, depressed, grief. No, no, no. Just everybody should be happy, 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 happy. (laughs) And it's like, no, grief is a part of this life. And we need to get a lot more comfortable with it moving forward so that we can be the best partners we can be to the earth. On the point of information in the media and, you know, the fire thing really struck me because it is one of those situations where you think that, you know, I think it's another instance in my life where I think one thing and it's actually another. Mm -hmm. So where do you get your information and where would you suggest that our girls go to for information about the earth, about climate change, Mm -hmm. about what's going on in the world that they could trust and that they could be a source of, you know, unfiltered insight. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I really love the For the Wild podcast, which is what um, Mm -hmm. me and my team produce. And we talk to legends all over the world in the social and environmental justice movements. And we'll go from talking about fires to then talking about orcas to then talking about, um, you know, gold mining to talking about indigenous sovereignty, slavery, uh, all over the place because it is all connected. So at this intersectional justice, these intersectional justice conversations. So I, the, the people that we have on the podcast are just incredible. And I respect every one of them so much. And it's a lot of intimate, dense, like a dense fruitcake conversations where you're like, whoa, I think I'm going to listen to that one again, because that was a lot. I just interviewed Andrea Crosta this week who works for this Elephant Action League. And he's basically like a 007 of wildlife poaching, which is like, I think it was like the fourth biggest money-making industry in the world or something. It's like billions of dollars every year, wildlife poaching, like crazy. No way. Oh my God. Yes. Billions, billions. It's like the fourth largest. I, and I, I, had, I, I don't want to say the statistic wrong, but it was shocking. Right. And is it like... Bl- Black market, yes. like what is? Yes. I think yes. a lot of it's like Russia and China. Yes. China is like savage. Yes, wow. there's so much. I mean, and, and it's huge. It's m- mafia. Mm. There's there's real mafia. There's cartels. There's murder. There's all the things that you'd watch in a movie about what's happening in the wildlife trade. But it's just an example, or like talking about GMOs. And so I, I really, really love what um, we do and what the guests share. In terms of other other media outlets. I know that there are, well, I guess one thing I want to say too is if, yeah, if we're talking about the earth, obviously there's a lot, democracy now is great. It's not so much focused on earth stuff, although it is, it's it's a bit more political, but it's, I, I love democracy now. I think it's a really good source of more like daily news. So you can kind of keep up with, whoa, that's happening in Russia. Holy shoot. Like Guatemala, you know, it's like, it gets you on the, on the daily getting involved with, local groups, you know, trustworthy local groups that are doing, doing the work, um, in a, in a way that feels holistic and intersectional. And cause then you're going to find a lot of news that isn't going to be really anywhere. You're going to find like, Whoa, I didn't realize they were spraying Roundup in the park down the road. Or I, I didn't realize that this incarceration issue was happening or, or whatever. Or like, I didn't realize the ocean in this part of where I live had this toxic spill that nobody's talking about. So I do think that really getting involved with the local community for those kind of issues are really important. And th- there's so much um, now in terms of like, is that, does that have media to it? I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure some groups do, but it's mm-hmm. also like finding what your passion is because, you know, we've been talking, there's so many things to get involved in. We can't get involved in everything. So really find what brings you alive and and then just use Google, you know, just get on there and just start diving mm-hmm. in. Go to, go down all the wormholes to follow the white rabbit. Like, you know, you can get lost in there, but you'll find the, you know, potentially some really great stuff. And yeah. in terms of the fires, and- the, who I'm quoting in terms of like the information I gave you mm-hmm. is Dr. Chad Hansen. And we interviewed him a few, gosh, when was it now? Within, I think, the last six months. Yeah, 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 it was. And he um, runs the John Muir Project. He's also on the board of the Sierra Club. Mm. And so he cool. is a really reputable source around fires. But what I will say around fires, there is so much um, disagreement around how to manage land for fire. And there's a lot of reputable people saying a lot of different things. So I will say on that subject particularly, Whoever is going to be diving into that based off listening on this interview, just be aware that you're going to hear a lot of different opinions from a lot of people who seem really smart and really into it. And I, um, what I like to look out for when I get information like that, especially scientific information, it's like, who is funding the study? You really got to look at that. It's like, well, who's funding the study? Who's making money off of the solution or whatever? And then you can start. Re- then you can start asking yourself, like, well, how much do I trust this based off who's involved behind the scenes and who's making money off of it? And then you can be like, oh, well, I don't know about that because then this people like it makes sense why it's being marketed in this way, right? And and you, you spoke to just like your you kind of recommit yourself 
um, to the earth every day. I'd love to know like what that looks like. And for people, you know, anywhere they are on the earth, Mm -hmm. like what are things that they can do every day Mm -hmm. to just kind of like reconnect themselves? Because a lot of us, you know, we've been talking a little bit lately about even being in our bodies Mm -hmm. and how we forget we're in a body sometimes because we want to escape. And so like, it's kind of the same thing where like, I like, sometimes I forget that I'm like on this beautiful planet or like, you know, we're in Southern California. We're so lucky. It's so, you know, so beautiful in so many parts of this area. And I I just sometimes forget. So to like, kind of like Mm. reestablish that connection, I think is really important. Mm. So what do you do? Mm. Well, it's really simple. It's really simple, but it does take a certain amount of um, dedication, there's another word I was thinking of, maybe it'll come to me again, but what I do is I walk every day and rain, shine, snow, doesn't matter. And I'm not trying to like hike to the summit. I'm not trying to like, oh, get my cardio up. It's not what it's about. It's walking slowly. And then I will stop at places that call me. And the only way that I know that a place calls me is that I've slowed down enough and I'm not distracted by my phone or whatever. And then I'll be like, oh, and then I'll look and maybe it's a big leaf maple. I really love big leaf maples. Or maybe it's a little waterfall on the creek or maybe it's a cloud that's going by. Whatever is calling me in that moment. And then I actually will stop. And a lot of times I'll sit on the earth and I'll just, I will just sit. I will, it's not like there's not a formula and I'm not somebody... If somebody was like, oh, I want to do a meditation for 30 minutes, I'd be like, oh my God, no, 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 no. Like way too much anxiety for that. Like, I, you know, I'm not like somebody who's really rigid mm-hmm. in the way that I pray. I'm not rigid in the way that I connect with the earth. It's very, it's really slow and there's no pressure because I know when I was trying to connect with the earth, I felt a lot of pressure to do it a certain way or, oh, okay, there's like this tactic and this is how you get through and this is how you really meditate and this is how you find enlightenment or something. But for me, it didn't come like that. It came with a lot of slowness and it comes with a lot of listening. And what I've been noticing lately is that um, because it's winter and I love waterfalls, I've been, I've been walking and I've been following these waterfalls to their headwaters. And, I will, and, I, and I'm not trying to get anywhere I'm just really trying to be with the element. And and then I'll just sit and I'll kind of soften my eye gaze and I'll just have so much gratitude pouring out of the beauty of the noise, mm-hmm. like the noise of the water or the the wind rushing through the trees and all the nuances that you start to hear when you just don't do anything and you're just you're just you just are with a place and I get so much out of that. So many of my all pretty much all the ideas that I ever have are from these moments when I'm just listening to the forest or the ocean or the desert. I mean, I love it all. Like I, I work in the temperate rainforest, but I was just, you know, in, in um, Joshua tree in Utah. And I mean, it's incredible there. So I don't think it has to be a certain ecosystem. I think they're all absolutely incredible. And the other thing I'll say, like I talk to plants and, and it was something that I remember learning from a teacher and I was like, oh my gosh, I really want to be able to talk to plants, but how do you do it? Like, do you, do you say hello? Do you, you know, like, do you knock on the trunk? Like, what do you, Mm -hmm. how do you do that? And what I found is the same thing. It's like, you have to slow down enough. You actually have to build a relationship with the earth and with the plants to be able to have that moment. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not an, it's not an app. We like, there's no app for it. There's no quick fix for it. I don't believe that. I think it's literally like, how do you build a relationship with your friend? You call them, you text them, hey, I heard you're having a hard day, bring them soup, you meet them for lunch. It's like you talk to them, you listen to them, you just hang out. We need to just hang out as if we're creating a friendship, as if we're taking care of our mother, as if we're making love with our partner. It's like we actually need that type of time to be with the earth, whether it's a tree down the street of your suburbs. It could, it could be anything. It, it could be the ocean. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't think there is a prescription to what it has to be. And you don't have to be in the wilderness. You don't have to, you could be in a city. It doesn't matter. The earth still speaks, but are we willing to listen? And are we willing to, to actually shut off the distractions of modernity 
to be able to hear anything, to be able to witness. And I think a lot of times, like when we do slow down to listen, we there's so, and I don't like the word answers, but there's so much information that will flood into us just by observation. And and that's another thing. Like a lot of us think, oh, well, we need to be scientists. We need to go to school to understand these environmental issues. We need to like have some kind of higher education. It's like, you know what the higher education is? Building a relationship with the land and observation. Of course, like science, you know, mm-hmm. not to say, not to say we don't need science, but each and every one of us are ecosystem engineers. Each and every one of us are stewards of the land. We need to reawaken that in ourselves. And the only way we're going to reawaken that is to actually build relationship. Okay, my friends think I'm very annoying because I keep telling them how incredible Daily Harvest is. And I mean it. If you watch my Insta stories, you know it's on there a lot because I'm just saving so much time, so much money. And I'm feeling really good because the food is incredible. These little cups are filled with meals that warm your heart. Um, So what Daily Harvest does is they are freezing fruits and vegetables within hours of being harvested, which retains the nutrients and locks in the freshness. So it's kind of like hitting pause on nature, if you will. But they create these beautiful meals that are nourishing and just downright delicious. Uh, So you can choose from more than 50 ready to blend smoothies, savory harvest bowls, uh, soups, breakfast bowls, and each single serving cup comes ready to blend or heat. It honestly is as simple as that. So I'm obsessed with the harvest bowls uh, and I just toss it into a pan with a little bit of avocado oil. No more than four minutes later, it's done and ready to be eaten. I wanted to give you my top three harvest bowls that I'm loving right now. The Brussels sprouts and lime pad thai, which has Brussels sprouts, kale, carrot, kelp, almond, jalapeno, tamari, ginger, sesame, lime. It's insane. I also love the butternut squash and kale shakshuka. Oh, say shakshuka. And then I also love the sweet potato and wild rice hash, which I actually have for breakfast sometimes. And I put a little egg on top. What's great is that you can use these daily harvest um, harvest bowls in particular as like a base. And you can always add a protein if you want. I'm also obsessed with their smoothies. It's summer. I'm craving my smoothies. So check it out. Daily dash harvest.com. You can use our code almost 30 to get three free cups in your first box. This is a subscription service that I am so glad I started. I'm not a subscription girl normally, but this has made my life so much easier. So I do one delivery a month of 24 cups and it's the best thing I've done lately. I highly recommend daily dash harvest.com. Use the code almost 30 for three free cups in your first box. Calling all health nuts. We got the nut for you. Uh, Skinny dipped, you know them. You know we love them. And I will tell you to all blue in the face that this sweet snack is healthy. It's full of protein, fiber, and made with the most thoughtful organic ingredients. And it's super simple. So it's nothing scary. You don't have to wonder like what is in this thing. It's just delicious and slightly addicting. They're now in most airports, which I love so much. And we've gotten so many um, tags on Instagram of people finding them in airports and being like, I found it almost 30. I'm trying the peanut butter. Uh, Yeah. Which is my favorite. I'm also loving their new mint flavor in the dark purple packaging, which is just so gorgeous. Uh, This snack is something that we bring with us on the road before our workout, before a show, after a show, a little sweet treat whatever you want. We trust them. We love them. We had the founders of Skinny Dipped on the show not too long ago. Check out that episode. It's a super inspiring story. And they created this empire out of nothing. And it's a female owned um, and founded company. So you know, we love that and are inspired by them constantly. So go to skinnydipped.com, S-K-I-N-N-Y-D-I-P-P-E-D.com. Use the code ALMOST30 for 20% off your first order. I would recommend buying in bulk. This is a very smart move. You can give it to people as little gifts. Um, It's a perfect summer snack to bring to the beach. Um, I recommend putting them in the freezer before that, bring them to the beach and they'll be slightly defrosted and just delicious. Uh, But yeah, let us know what you love. Skinnydip.com. Use the code almost 30 for 20% off your order.
Yeah, it's already inside of us. I think that's like a really good point because a lot of people think they need to seek out like to become that, Mm -hmm. you know, that they're not that and they like come from that like lack mentality. And um, yeah, I just think that's a really beautiful point. And I love your practices. It like brought tears to my Mm -hmm. eyes. It's like very powerful. I think too, you know, mother nature is the most feminine. Mm -hmm. So we must approach her in a feminine way, which means slowly and no expectations Mm -hmm. and softly rather than, you know, in a masculine way of like, okay, scheduled out, I'm going (laughs) to do this and I'm going to look for this. And this is going to be the answer Mm -hmm. to this, you know, starting the relationship with the the great feminine mother Mm -hmm. is by stepping into our feminine ourselves so that we can match her. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. I would love to talk about briefly uh, the state of climate change for our girls. So um, what has been happening uh, the past few years? I know climate change is a big topic. It's been a big topic for a long time, but um, what has been happening on earth in that space and what can we do to help? Okay, I'm going to start off with the scary because I, I'm i kind of a person who's like, give me the bad stuff first and then like, let me know. Yeah. <laughs> let me know the... Um, yes. We are absolutely in very, very dire times. Anybody who tells you otherwise is just trying to appease you. There's a report that came out and this was like, I think in January or February. Yeah. So the the, the Intergovernmental Panel, panel on Climate Change um, released a report a couple, like back in January. And it, it basically said, we have 12 years. We have 12 years wow. to do a number yep. of things. And if we don't do these things, we will be in catastrophic climate change that will not be reversible. And this is like the intergovernmental panel. I mean, this is not just like a group at a university. No, no, no. This is a global panel of the most brilliant climate scientists in the world. It's not like, I just want to make that clear because it's not like some fringe people are saying it's bad. It's like even the New York Times is talking about it now. Where a couple of years ago, the New York Times and all these other people, they weren't even talking about climate change. Mm. The fact that climate change is becoming mainstream should make all of us worried because that actually means that shit's way worse than we even think it is, which it is. Um, Is climate change reversible at this point? From all of the conversations and studying that I have done with climate scientists, no, it's it's not reversible at this point. We've gone too far over the edge. Does that mean that we're all going to die? No. Um, does that mean that things will change drastically? Yes. And um, you know, we could have a whole conversation just on on what's happening with climate change today. A couple of things I also want to point out is, so climate change has kind of been talked about since the 60, 60s, 70s. I mean, we've been collecting data for decades on this now. It's not a new topic. It's new to the mainstream. And what I think is really fascinating is that even in the past few years, like I went to Paris for COP21 back in 2012. And this is a global event that brings countries from all over the world to talk about how we're going to commit to reducing our carbon footprint, basically, and amongst many other things. And what I find absolutely fascinating and so disturbing is that with the more climate science that comes out saying, holy shit, we're in dire straits, we only burn more fossil fuels. We only create more plastic. The landfills have only gotten bigger and we're only consuming more. So I'm like, holy shit, if we're not totally addicted to modernity, I can't understand this in any other way. There's another word that I've heard from, and I use this example a lot from an interview I did with Arielle Duranger, who is the executive director of Indigenous Climate Action in Canada. And she talks about this word called Wichigo, which is an Algonquin word that means this cannibalistic mind virus. I do think that on some level, if whether we call it we to go or whether, who knows what we want to call it, we are infected because we are literally murdering our own home and only doing it faster and faster with the more disruption we see. And it's like, I, I literally say with this all the time, like, how the hell are we doing this? We've been talking about how bad plastic is and how are we only creating more plastic when we know, how are we only burning more fossil fuels? When we've been talking about this for years, but we're just burning more. I, I can't, I like, I can't even handle this mentality that we're in. And I think we must be so addicted that, you know, when things, when we hear how bad it is, or we hear that things are going to get taken away from us, we only want to consume and burn more because it's like our last hurrah. It's like we're just trying mm-hmm. to like get it in our veins. We want to get all the fossil fuel in our veins as fast as we can before we can't yeah. anymore. I, I mean, these are just some thoughts I try to 
like answer these existential questions around. And so when people hear climate change, like there was a lot of talk like, oh, well, it means global warming. Well, it means this, that. And then, and, to, and just to say too, that climate change has also been something that has tried to be covered up. And there's been millions, if not billions of dollars in industry tactics to cover up what's happening for years and to also create the rifts of people going, oh, there is no climate change and the people together is like 99% of scientists have admitted that climate change is real. Now we still have groups like the Koch brothers who say it isn't real. And then we have like Trump that said it wasn't real at one point. Um, That's all bought and paid for. There's a reason why there's this fissure between groups. And there's a reason that this misinformation is out there because the oil and gas industries wanted to confuse people so that we'd literally be fighting about it for years. For decades, we've been fighting if climate change is even real. So we weren't even doing anything about it because we we're just fighting if it was real or not. Well, now it's it's unequivocally real. And we're at this point where we passed many tipping points like the methane clathrates in the Arctic. And what that means is as the ice melts and melts and melts and melts, there's it's not just carbon methane is being released into the atmosphere from that. And then and then you can kind of think like the hotter the planet gets, the more ice that melts, then the hotter it, the faster it melts and the hotter it gets. It's like we know that these things build upon each other. And in some places it's not that every place is going to get hotter. And it's not that every place is going to get drier. Some places will get wetter, some places will get drier, some places will get hotter, some places won't. Also speaks to soil fertility. It also speaks to available clean water. It also speaks to, you know, when we think about climate change, a a huge topic we need to consider is farms. The large farms in the Midwest, we've depleted so much topsoil. And now that there's change in weather patterns, that really affects the way that our entire food growing system is uh, completed at this point. Or I think about the Amazon. I'm just going to throw out examples of like what, what we've been seeing. So the Amazon rainforest is literally becoming a savanna. It's changing from being the largest lungs of the earth rainforest to becoming a savanna because of illegal logging and legal logging. And then you mix that with climate change. We can't just look at climate change as a, it's not separate. It's something that's happening, but we keep feeding the beast. And like, so for instance, with the Amazon, so we've cut these trees, uh, the trees are connected to the oceans. They call the water. They change all of the systems of all of the wind and the waters that move around the earth. And when we create these disruptions in certain places, then it stops the functioning uh, cycles that happen through the earth. And then, oh, all of a sudden, the Amazon is becoming drier. Oh my gosh, all of a sudden, we don't have as much rainforest. Oh my gosh, all of a sudden, we can't sequester as much carbon. Oh my gosh, we don't have the water anymore. So it's like we have to see it in these these, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, like in this connected Jenga game of, of, of pieces mm. that are interconnected. And, and so um, it's such a complicated topic and all of these things are, but what we need to know is that it is coming and that means bigger storms and that means more fires and that means more flooding. And it also means um, there's going to be a a lot of really weird solutions being sold to us, like logging. Like logging to to stop climate change, that's ridiculous. You release carbon every time you cut a tree. And just to kind of break down carbon, so carbon was stored in the ground. It's stored in the trees, it's stored in plants, it's stored in the soil. It's old fossils that are stored and it's good for the soil. We need carbon in the soil. But every time we log or every time we till soil or every time we damage the land in some way, but we are releasing the carbon into the atmosphere. And when we release the carbon and now the methane and all these greenhouse gases are going into the atmosphere and it's creating what we're, you know, creating this climate change um, system that we're in. Now, so cutting more trees doesn't make sense. Planting trees, which is a very complicated topic and it's not just as easy as plugging trees into the ground as much as I wished it was. That actually eats the carbon. It's like trees eat carbon. Redwoods sequester more carbon than any tree in the world. And so we need more plants to help us at this point. But what we don't need is these false solutions like logging or like I think Harvard University is creating this new, is creating this new ridiculous 
geoengineering quote unquote solution where they're going to be spraying all these heavy metals into the sky, which they're already doing with chemtrails to be able to block out the sun so that the sun doesn't reach the earth in the same way. So we're like, Come we're on, like dude. millions of dollars are going. I think they're already, yeah, they're already doing, they're that. already doing that, but you this know, is yeah, like, with like chemtrails even more intense. Like this is like an even like, like yeah. literally wanting to create an entire layer around the earth so Fuck the you harvard yeah and it's like holy sh- how does that it's, it's like wait we're willing to be- like it's like harvard stop with spraying stop. it's like yeah. once you say spraying i'm out i'm, I'm say serious. spray i'm out and then it's like why are why do why do we go to the edges of technology to figure out how to deal yeah. with the solution rather than just dealing with it and what i know how do we- it's almost like wow. a like a like a like a dick waving contest <laughs> yeah. it's like let me th- let me think of the most complicated mm-hmm. whatever like solution study da 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 and it's like hey it could be really simple and yeah. the reason we do that you know. is because we want more industry and we want more money and yeah. we want to keep buying and we don't yeah. want to give up our lifestyles we do mm-hmm. not yeah. want to give up modernity and so we are willing to push any weird technology any any creature over the edge just to make sure that we sustain our addictions and i i think about mm. like I think about the um, renewable energy industry. And I will say right now, like I am not speaking from a purist. I'm not speaking from a cushion on the mount. Like I have solar panels. I have a battery. I have cars. I'm speaking to you from an Apple computer. I have a podcast with a microphone. Like in no way am I not involved in this whole fossil fuel economy. And at the same time, I'm looking at it and I'm going, wow. Because I'm, you know, I'm work a lot in the activist circles and there's a lot about the just transition and there's a lot about renewable energies and like that's the way forward and I go to these environmental conferences and you know oh whoops we're throwing away like uh, all these plastic cups but it's okay because we got solar panels coming along well it's like can we break down solar panels for a minute like where do they come from who makes them how long do they last where do the batteries go who's mining them what slave labor is building them and is this not just another yeah. effing industry? Because in my eyes, we're using fossil wow. fuels mm. to create a whole new industry, all new infrastructure, new factories, new resource extraction sites. What really, what we need to be asking each other is like, how the hell can we start breaking our addiction to consuming so damn much? And why the hell are we so entitled to think that we should have access to shit all the time? Why do we think it's okay? And even like, we're so nonchalant about Amazon bringing stuff to our door the next day. We're so nonchalant. Now there's like Uber Eats. They're going to have like drones bringing coffee to us. It's like, we're so nonchalant about it. Not ever thinking about all the resources it takes to get that. And like, why do we think we are so <laughs> entitled to this life that's killing everything? It's really, it's fascinating. And I'm in it. Like I am asking the questions as a feeding fossil fuel addict, you know, I'm asking it from that angle, not from the other side that I figured it all out. But we really need Mm. to be asking ourselves, what are we willing to do about climate change? Not what can we do? We can do a shit ton. I mean, there are, there are so many things we could be doing. What are we actually willing to do at this point? And I think about this a lot, you know, we can talk all we want. We can present pretty pictures. We can, you know, make ourselves feel better and one way or another, but unless we are really willing to look at ourselves and even like, I would rather even just have a conversation with people admitting me like, you know what? (sighs) I really am not going to give up this stuff. And then at least we're talking from an honest place and then we can actually just prepare that we're not going to potentially mitigate anything at this point. So I think when I, you know, I think about solutions, I'm not the person who's going to be like, it's okay. Let's just get some solar panels. Let's get our electric car. Like, let's bring our reusable cup. Are those things important? Yes. I don't want to demean them. I don't want to say there's absolutely no benefits to being in right relationship with the earth. Or like, honestly, the fact that we use so much plastic for one use food products is gross. I'm like, who are we? Why? why I know, do we dude. Think we I know. I was just thinking that? about that. Like, why do and I mm. do it? Like, why do I think it's okay to buy like yeah. all these like lesser evil popcorn bags in my car? Like, w- what about yeah. me thinks it's okay that that you know it's like this huge disconnection? So, so I think you know, using less energy, using less. Period. Like that is, I think, probably the bi- one of the biggest things we can do. Use less. And invest in our communities locally. Invest in local food growing. Invest in, you know, local support. Like 
yes, use quote unquote green things when you can. But honestly, green is just so greenwashed at this point that anything green is basically natural and anything natural is basically seven up because it it's not it's not real. It's marketing. It is like we gotta remember like why are we being sold certain things and like what are these polit bill political bills passing? You know, we we have to we have to be watching out just knowing that people are trying to bamboozle us at every angle. Um but yeah, so I think like ultimately we need to be in right relationship with the earth in terms of like a solution. Like what can we do? Get let's get in right relationship. Like let's start building the relationship. Let's start building community resiliency because even if we like even if we all somehow organize tomorrow and and really started making shit happen and taking down dams and stopping resource extraction projects and you know stop driving cars, we're still going to be having effects of climate change. Those are not going to go anywhere at this point. If we if we really made some large global solutions, would that help? Yes, it would help, but it's not going to alleviate the pain that is coming our way that already is in many places in the world. And a lot of times we just can't feel a lot of it because we have modernity to like cushion us from the blow. It's like, well, we still have air conditioning. Well, we still have water in our taps. Well, we still have access to A, B, and C. So we don't have to feel the the reality of the situation as much in this country and probably a lot of the listeners who are listening. I mean, the fact if you can even listen to a podcast on a device, like you're probably not feeling it as much as other people that have to walk five miles to get water and their well is dry, dry, drying up because there's none left. Um, and so, and I think also for me, how I deal with climate change is, yeah, educating myself, really, really questioning my own existential needs and then getting involved in land-based um, projects because the earth is resilient. The earth is resilient. And a lot of people say the earth will be fine. It's the humans. Like, will the humans survive? I don't know, but the earth will be fine. I actually despise when people say the earth will be fine. So I'm like, are you speaking for the earth? Is that what the earth told you? That like, she'll be fine when she mm. loses like everything she had for billions of years. Cause I don't know if fine is the word I'd use. I'd maybe use like the earth will evolve. Like, sure. You know, but like fine, it's just like such a gross thing to me. Cause I'm like, we're losing 200 species a day and we're going to say she's fine. She's losing 200 children. You know, it's like, this is crazy to say that. Aww. But I think that, yeah. um, but I think that we can um, really get involved in land-based projects and support the resiliency of land in climate change. Like one thing that I, what's an example? Yeah, sorry, yeah. what's an example of a land-based project? Well, one thing I'm super passionate about is dam removal. We ha- like we are clogging mm-hmm. the arteries of the earth, and while we still have fossil fuels readily available, we need to be pumping fossil fuels into excavators to take down dams immediately. No, no more new dams and take down the old dams. Because if we want any chance of having salmon again, if we want any chance of like, uh, having the, the lifeblood of land be able to flow, we need those dams gone. So, um, you know, there, there have been dam removals. There are more scheduled, but like, you know, thinking about Shasta, they want to raise that dam. And it's a huge indigenous sovereignty issue. And it's like, get involved with that. You know, does that relate to climate change? So is it, uh-huh. is a dam like just for, mm-hmm. so people understand like, you know, why is a dam built mm-hmm. in the first place, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what does it provide? And then what is it actually doing um, to the land? Yeah. So a dam um, is basically like a big concrete wall that holds water back and it's created for hydroelectricity which is electricity. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, it's a way to power our lives, power our modern lives. Many of these dams were like built in the fifties, sixties. Um, so they're not really even, they're, they're not, they're not even giving us a lot of electricity for what they are. They're kind of, they're not great. They're not really, they're not efficient, I guess is the word I've used. And so you can imagine that a river, rivers and riparian zones, which are the lands around rivers, they are so vital. They are so vital. And you look at like Los Angeles and the river, Colorado River is literally a concrete thing. Like it's not a river anymore. Like uh, look, think about all the- Yeah, shit's nasty. It's nasty. It's like, so think about it. If you have plants and soil around a river, those plants and that soil and and those fungi, they're going to help clean the water. They're going to help 
um, soak the water in. I mean, it's a whole system. It's going to feed its habitat, blah, blah, blah. We concrete it up. And then we're literally like killing. We're just killing whole communities of, of creatures, plants, um, microbes. It's just, it's gone. And all the ecosystem services that earth will do before it's concreted is absolutely incredible. And we can't even quantify it financially because it's like billions of dollars of ecosystem services. So when you dam a river, there's so many things that happen. I mean, one, like fish can't get up. Um, two, uh, because of the logging around rivers, there's a lot of erosion that's come in. And then that's, it creates sedimentation in the river. It changes the shape of the river. Fish can't spawn because they're, they're dying. Their gills are being um, flooded with the sedimentation from the erosion. You have like the water gets mm-hmm. hotter because it's not moving. Like rivers flow. But if you stop a river, it's like this hot, stagnant water. Then you have invasive species that come in. You have algae blooms. I mean, like it's, it's a very long list of what will happen because they are the lifeblood. They are the arteries of the land. You clog the arteries by putting dams in. So that's just one thing, like dams. I mean, I'm, I'm very passionate about taking dams. I'm very passionate about um, stopping new resource extraction projects. No new mines, no new fracking sites, no tar sands, no oil drilling, none of that. No offshore, no inshore, doesn't matter. Done. Like if that's happening in your community or if you want to get involved with something like the tar sands or like Pebble Mine up in Bristol Bay, Alaska, has the largest salmon run left in the world. They're talking about building the largest gold mine in the world. <laughs> like the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Trump just reopened it. Trump just reopened Bears Ears, Grand Escalante for more oil. It's our public lands that have been protected and now they're being reopened under this administration to do more fossil fuel extraction. So in terms of climate change, the things we can really do that I think are really powerful is get involved with the community and friggin' organize. Organize like there ain't no tomorrow because there isn't. It's always our responsibility to take care of the land. I know we probably were raised with this mentality that's like, oh, well, that land set aside or somebody else is going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it. We actually all are responsible to protect the land, especially our public lands. And that's also something that I feel like there's so much information on for people to get involved in. So many different organizations that are fighting the good fight to keep these lands um, protected and to keep them from having new resource extraction projects. And the and you know a big problem is is that economic development because people are struggling. People will continue to struggle, especially with climate change. And when you go into these communities that are very poor and you offer them a new industry, you offer them a new mine, a new, you know, some bullshit, yeah. it's really hard for them to say no and even destroy their own land and, and poison their own water because they don't have any economic, very, very little economic mobility. mobility. Thank you. So again, it's like we have to build resiliency in our communities away from the fossil fuel economy. And I could give you examples, but it's really listening to the communities of like what they need and like what the ecosystem is asking in that space. But there's just so many things to get involved in to stop new fossil fuel extraction projects and to and close down the ones that are already in operation. But then the question is like, well, <laughs> but it's hard when, when let's say I as an individual am going to keep them. If, if I as an individual am going to keep demanding a very resource fossil fuel intensive life, but at the same time, I'm going to be like, but stop the da 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 da. It's like, well, you know, it doesn't have as much power. It doesn't have as much punch <laughs> to the to the power of the situation. Yeah. But nonetheless, like, it's a it's a big thing to curb your addiction and to become an organizer or to be a part of the organizing the movement. But I would say, don't get trapped in the enormity of it. Don't get trapped in being imperfect. Just start get involved and you will figure out and you will be so in enli- like working for the earth is so enlivening because you know i don't even know i don't want to answer because it just is and so even though i am like oh my gosh like how do i i'm also like yes 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 and every new person i meet and every new project i do and every new connection it it feeds the fire and i think that kind of leads mm-hmm. me to this feeling of of having sacred rage and being really energized 
by the anger, by the overwhelm, by the. Yo, I'm obsessed with that that mm-hmm. term, sacred rage. Yeah, sacred rage, because like you know, may, mm-hmm. maybe some of us are listening, going like, "Holy shit! Like, what do I mm-hmm. do? There's nothing to do. It's all too big. I'm so scared. I'm so sad. I'm so pissed. I'm so angry." Yes, yes, yes. Use it. Use it. Use it. Light like you. I, I light fires a lot. So I have a wood burning stove, and it's like start the kindling, add to the kindling. Everything that we do is adding to the kindling and it's warming us. It's warming us. It's warming us. And it's, and it's getting us ready to be earth warriors, which is what we need to do. And I have a, a dear friend, Nidia Alicia, who um, works a lot with um, tribal nations in California and Oregon and also does a lot of immigration work. And she was, we were talking the other night. She's like, Ayana, she's like, we are at war. We are at war right now. And, I'm, and I was like, whew, mm. like it's a big word to use. And absolutely we are. That's what we are. We're at war with yeah. people and us included destroying our home. And it's, it's called ecocide. I mean, that's, that's what's going on. So I don't know if I fully answered your question, but I just want to say that, yeah, not cl- climate change, not great, not great. We're in a r- real bad. It's very, very bad. And there are many things we can do about it. It's like, there's, there's, there's so many things we can do about it. Not one person can do them all. But that's why we have to go into ourselves. We need to listen to the land, build that relationship, really, really focus, really listen deeply, find what that passion is, feed the passion with the grief, with the sacred rage, with the overwhelm, with the sadness, with the love, with the passion, with the excitement, like fill it and just work from that place. Mm. And at the same time, like what I also really like to do and what I need to do is be totally humble in doing the work. Like people go, oh, well, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to start. Go to a city hall meeting, go to a nonprofit meeting, go to, go somewhere, wash the dishes, clean off the table, stay a little later, help move the chairs back into place. Like you can literally, those little things matter so much just to be of service, just to be a support system to, so you can, maybe I'm talking to people out there that are like, whoa, I've never done any of this stuff. I am totally not ready to lead a charge. And if you've never done any of this stuff, absolutely don't lead a charge, but be the support system to the leaders that are making the charges to the, you know, to the governors of the, this like ecocidal war we're in Mm. and you will be so valuable and you will be so needed and you will be so respected and so tenderly cared for as somebody who just shows up and does the dishes and listens. So I feel like even for those folks who are starting at that level, just know that you are wanted, you are desired, and you are valuable, even if you feel like you have nothing to offer. Mm, That's beautiful. Thank you. That was beautiful. That was a great answer. That was, <laughs> I'm just that so, was yeah. beautiful. I'm it's so really powerful. Thankful. Yeah. There's so much more that we could talk about with you. There's, I mean, I have so yeah. much written down that, you know, I'd love to maybe talk about another time, mm-hmm. like indigenous sovereignty, um, organic farming, you know, all this kind of stuff. But I'm so thankful for your time. Um, this was very important mm-hmm. for us to, you know, just reconnect with and for our community to mm-hmm. connect with and reconnect with. And, um, I'm excited to really spark a greater conversation about this within Almost 30 Nation yeah. to see what we can do together. Mm-hmm. Um, where can our lovely community connect with you? Mm-hmm. Well, our website is forthewild.world. And then for the wild and under for the wild, just to give you a brief synopsis of what we're up to. So we have our media part, which is the podcast and webinars and we're going to be creating a new podcast around um, issues regarding the temperate rainforest region, which is Northern California to Alaska. And then the other part of our work is land-based conservation restoration. And if, for those of you who've heard of the One Million Redwoods Project, that's where that fits into. And so our website for the wild.world explains that all. The podcast you can find on Spotify, um, on iTunes, Patreon. Patreon would do like bonus material, get a little bit more in depth with the people that we have on more education links, stuff like that. And then um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, you can email us through our form site or you could email us at connect at forthewild.world. And yeah, I'm really grateful to be on and just to be able to share these uh, these moments with you and, and to mm-hmm. really connect, really connect. Like we... The hardest part sometimes is just having the conversation 
And then that's kind of this big hump to just to be able to bring our hearts to the table, knowing that they're going to be hurt and that, you know, we don't want to be hurt. We don't want to feel the pain. But Mm. when we do it together, especially in person, like, you know, we can hug each other. We can like give each other a little shoulder rub over it. We can like look into each other's eyes and be like, okay, you know, shit's bad, but we have each other and we're going to do this together and we're going to just take one step at a time. And I really appreciate both of you for be for being willing to talk about these things and and the interest and the engagement with it. It feels so good when you meet other earth lovers who are just willing to go there. It's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, your heart kind of revives Aww, because you yeah. feel um, like, you know, you're not alone in it. So I feel that way with you too. And I really appreciate you. Yeah. Us too. Thank you so much. Yeah, sending so, you so much. so much love. The work that you're doing is so, so important. And Mother Earth is so grateful. We are so mm-hmm. grateful. Your spirit and soul and it's probably so thankful mm-hmm. for, mm-hmm. you know, the mission and purpose that you're doing. So appreciate it very much. We will hopefully see you another time soon and appreciate it. Enjoy enjoy your day in yeah. the beautiful cabin that we <laughs> see. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you both. Thank you so much to Ayana. You can visit forthewild.world for more information. Definitely tune in to her podcast, For the Wild. Yeah, and join the Secret Facebook group on Facebook and we can talk about what we're doing to make sure that we are loving Mother Earth. And please join us on tour. We have Nashville, Columbus, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Miami, New York. Chicago. Chicago. Philly. Philly. Um, okay review of the week love from Spain cool five stars <laughs> people probably think I'm crazy because I'm cracking up while walking to work but who cares I love the humor and bomb between Krista and Lindsay the topics and guests are inspiring and interesting and they do such a good job asking questions and it really feels like we're all learning something new together a must listen that's from Megan thank mm. you so much Megan thank you I, I say oh from Spain because I just forget I know I literally just think our moms and friends listen. I know. Still. <laughs> it's funny when we get tags for people that are in different languages. Yes. You know, it says almost 30 and then it's like a different language yeah. and stuff. It's so it's cool. really cool. So, so cool. It's really cool. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you for sharing with your friends. It is how we have grown this thing. It is how we are able to support you and the women in your community, the people in your community with this information, this important information from people like Ayana Young. So thank you so much. Yeah, and if you'd like to be a part of your local Almost 30 community, we have ambassadors all over the world. So you can learn more on our website, almost30podcast.com. Click on community and we cannot wait to meet you. Have a great, great week. Have a great day. Bye-bye.